Yu-Gi-Oh can be a difficult game at times, even for the best of players, so you can only imagine how rough it can be for new players. If you are a new player, or if you have a good memory of when you were a new player, then you don't have to imagine how rough it is. Because of all of the complications of the game, not only is it a lot of work for somebody to learn, but of course that also means it's difficult to teach. There's simply too much to teach. Duel Links does its best with the dual columns and dual school sections of the game to help new players learn about playing the game. Some tips you can find in the columns are actually pretty good advice. I know that most people ignore these, but if you're new, you really should take these seriously. In this one, Bastion and Alexis are talking about how to use backward removal, saying that if possible, you should do it on the end phase of the turn that the targeted backward was set. And it explains that your opponent won't be able to activate that backward on the same turn it was set. But also, using it on the end phase, being the last possible moment, means that since you're doing it at the last possible moment, the opponent will have to spend their battle phase not knowing what that back row is. But also not doing it during the main phase means that the opponent can't set another back row in its place before leaving the main phase. This is legitimately good advice, and it's not the only piece of good advice you can find in the dual column, but despite Konami's best efforts, the game simply has too much to teach. So with this video, I want to help you to help yourself if you want to be a competitive player, or if you simply want to be better than you are right now right now, I hope that this video is going to give you something that you can use. There are actually a few things you can do to improve your game that you wouldn't be blamed at all for not knowing, since they are a little bit out of the way and a bit difficult to understand just from looking at them. While you're in a duel, you can go to your menu and you'll be able to see your deck list and your settings. Taking a look at your deck list in the middle of your duel, in case you need to be reminded of something that you don't have direct access to, like if you want to read one of your own cards that you don't have in your hand but you have in your deck, maybe you've also forgotten how many copies of a card you play in total, so you can take a look at the deck list during the duel. Moving over to the settings though, first we can see the sound settings, which you can do whatever you like with, but then we have a bunch of important settings that can impact your dueling experience. In the camera settings, there are two options, player view and top down view. Player view has you looking at the field as if you were sitting at a table. When a monster is on the field, its artwork pops out of the card, and the general animations that happen on the screen are more exciting. I think that it can make for some very fun duels to use this mode, but there is a pretty big weakness to it that you can't see all information at once easily. You can see most of the fields just fine, but the animations might get in the way of some key information that you might end up missing by mistake. And sometimes in order to see a card, you'll need to scroll across the screen so you can see it. There's actually a function during duels where if you hold down on a player's graveyard or banish pile with your finger or with your mouse, you'll see the contents pop up on your screen. This can be quite useful if you want to know what resources your opponent might have available to them while you or your opponents are in the middle of something else. Like your opponent's thinking and you can't make any actions, you can still hold your finger or mouse down onto their grave to see what is in there. Or if you are in the middle of deciding whether or not to respond to something, you can press the checking field button at the bottom right hand of the screen, then hold down on their graveyard to check it. This is different than just pressing it during your main phase then pressing the button that lets you look since you skip the process by holding down because you can do this at all times and it's the same for your own graveyard and banish pile. The reason I bring this up is of course because it's good to know, but also because because while you are in player view, this is another aspect that might be made difficult. An opponent's monster art popping out of their card is definitely very cool, unless it's scrub art blue eyes, but it might get in the way of viewing their graveyard, and you could shift the screen around so that it isn't an issue, but with the seconds on the timer ticking down, you might be wasting your own time. You could just skip the process and use the top down view. In the top down view, all public information is easily available at all time. No need to shift the screen around. The downside of top down view is the loss of those cool animations, but the attack animations are still there. The summoning mechanic and ace monster animations are still there, and if you just want that cool factor of the artworks popping out of your cards, you can just simply press the change view button on the upper left of the dual screen just for when you're attacking for game or something, so you still get that cool feeling. The next options available to you are the card position options. This lets you decide whether your card placements on the field will be automatically chosen for you or you get to choose where on the field they go. The automatic setting can certainly be convenient as you just need to tell the game to put your cards in the field and the game won't ask you where specifically, but card placement is actually pretty important in Yu-Gi-Oh. It can make a pretty big difference in a lot of duels. If your deck uses Link Summoning, you will want to be able to choose where your monsters go, so that you don't mess up your arrows. If you summon a monster to a zone a link monster points to, but you wanted another monster to be there, and you can't exactly move that monster out of the way now that it's on the field, so you should make sure to choose where your monsters go carefully. But Undead, what if I'm not playing a link deck? 
He doesn't matter anymore, right? Well, let's say you are playing a deck that doesn't care at all about where you place your monsters. So you feel free to go with the automatic placement setting. But this is a two player game and your opponent may very well be playing a link deck. Links are among the most popular extra deck mechanics in the game right now. So it isn't unlikely. Link monsters can often gain benefits from monsters being in zones that they point to. And many link monsters, even when owned by the opponent, will point to your monster zone. For example, Decode Talker gains five 500 attack for every monster it points to, and it has one arrow that points upward to one of your zones. If you have the option not to summon a monster to the zone it points to, it would be smart to take that option. Do not give your opponent free attack points. And there really are more examples of this too, like Long Gearsu sending cards it points to to the grave with its arrows pointing towards your zones. You'd much prefer to summon it something to a zone that it doesn't point to. And Salamangrate Great Sunlight Wolf. If you summon a monster to the zone it points to, your opponent gets to add a fire monster from grave to their hand for free. And you might have avoided that by summoning your monster to another zone. Your monster zone placement is all handled by manual number one, but monster zone placement isn't the only thing that matters. Manual number two also lets you choose the zones for your back row to go into. This can be important for a couple different reasons. A big example that people like to bring up is Mech Knights. Mech Knights is an archetype of monsters that can special summon themselves to a column where there is already two cards. If you are playing Mech Knights, then you'd love to choose your back row placement to help you make a column have two cards in it. But if you are playing against Mech Knights, you don't want to give them an easier game on purpose. So if you have one monster in one column, then you can choose to set your back row into another column just to make things a little bit harder for your opponent. Opponent. Those little things can add up. This is definitely a good thing to keep in mind, but sometimes we can tell by some way or another that our opponent isn't playing mech knights. I would say that regardless, it's good practice setting your back row in columns other than the ones your monsters are in just to get your muscle memory ready for it and it's actually mech knights, but there is actually more benefit in duel links for setting your back row in the way that you choose. There's actually a psychological benefit for setting your back row in a certain way. The main enemy of back row, of course, is back row removal. And of course, if we set spells and traps face down, all of the ones that we set are equally likely to be hit by a back row removal. Or are they? The truth is, when a player has one back row removal in their hand and three set back row on the opponent's field, they know they aren't getting getting rid of all three, so they have to make a choice. Since all three options are equally unknown options, they tend to default to what feels comfortable to them, which tends to be hitting the one in the middle. There is some reasoning to this. Of course, players set their favorite back row first, and the automatic setting sets the first back row into the middle column. If you ever find yourself setting back row, try to see if you naturally want to set the one you are most eager to use before the others. And if you do, you'll see how many players feel confident that most most players set their favorite back row first. The thing is though, that just because you set something first, it doesn't necessarily have to mean that you set it into the middle column. And it doesn't necessarily have to mean that it's your favorite back row. But we can still take advantage of these notions that the community has by playing into their ideas. If they think that players set their most important back row first and they do it in the middle column, then you set your least important back row in the middle column first. As for the other two columns, if people aren't going to hit the middle, then they will psychologically most likely hit the column that their perspective would be where the beginning of a sentence is. For an English speaker, our writing system goes from left to right, for example, but Arabic is written from right to left. You can make an educated guess what language your opponent might speak by seeing where in the world they come from as it is shown before the duel starts. And then if you think they speak a language that is written left to right, then you set your second least important back row in your right hand column so that they hit that before your most important back row in your left, since from their perspective, they'd be going left to right and follow the same idea, but the other way around for players whose language is most likely right to left. Of course, this is not 100% guaranteed, as really, with back row removal, nothing is 100% guaranteed, but we can do a little bit of mind games just in case it works out. And this is what statistically works out a lot of the time. Another trick you can play is that if your deck happens to search for a back row during its combo that you don't intend on using during the same turn, but you have other back row in your hand, you could search for that back row. The opponent will know what it is since you searched for it, and then you can set a different back row. Then continue your combos before setting the actual searched back row at the end of the turn. This tricks the opponent into thinking that the back row that you set during your combo was the back row that you searched for. And so if 
if that back row scares them, they will hit it, and the search back row that they are scared of will be safe. And if they aren't scared of the back row that you search for, then they will not hit it, when in fact the card they are not hitting is the one they don't know about that they should be scared of. The next option you have is the chain option. The two different options here are the self chain on and self chain off. When a card or effect is activated, both players have the chance to respond to it, but the opponent of the one activating the effect gets the first chance. If you have this setting set to self chain off, then the opponent will get a chance. Then if they say they don't want to activate anything in response, then the initial effect will resolve. But if you put the setting to self chain on, then the opponent will get a chance. Then if they say no, then the game will ask you if you want to chain anything to your own effect. This is much preferred to not having the choice to, since you might have an effect that relies on your own card being activated for it to chain itself to. A good example is Cyber Slash Harpy Lady. If a spell or trap is activated, it can chain to it in order to return a monster to the hand. If your opponent activates a spell or trap, it's no problem, because it will immediately ask you if you want to use the Cyber Slash. But if you want to proactively use your effect, you can use a spell or trap of your own. Then you would need the self chain on option to be set in order to be given the chance to use the Cyber Slash effect. The next set of options you are given are perhaps the most important out of all the options so far. And unlike the options before, these can make such a big difference that if you don't know how to effectively utilize them, then you are crippling yourself beyond just simple misplays. These options refer to how often you will be asked if you want to respond to something. The automatic option means that if a card's settings in the game's files meet the context for when they normally make sense to be activated, you will be asked to activate it. For example, the card Book of Moon. If there is a face-up monster on either player's side of the field while you have Book of Moon available to activate, then the game will ask you whenever something happens if you want to activate. This is actually limited though because in Yu-Gi-Oh! there exists a period of time between things happening called an open game state. This simply means that there is no chain in the process of being built, no cards resolving, no actions taking place at all. During this point, quick effects can be activated. Think of it like a brief phase at the end of a chain resolving where a new quick effect can happen before the duel can return to normal. A common example of an open game state is the draw phase or the standby phase. The majority of draw phases and standby phases, nothing happens other than the draw for the turn. But during these phases, either player can decide to use a quick effect, since nothing else is happening. The automatic setting doesn't let you do anything during an opening game state, however, and neither does the tap setting, which is basically the automatic setting but with a weird bonus that doesn't really work. The toggle setting, however, puts a button on your dual screen called the toggle that lets you switch between three options, off, on, and auto. All three of these options have their uses. The auto function of the toggle does the same thing that the automatic setting does. It asks you if you want to activate something when the game registers that it would make sense to ask you. The on setting gives you the full reins, asking you at every conceivable moment when you have the right to do so if you want to activate something. Having the toggle on gives you all of the control, but it also lets your opponent know due to the delays that you are planning something fishy. And it can also get pretty annoying to be asked the same thing every couple of seconds when you're going to be saying no the majority majority of the time. Majority of the time, you should have your toggle set to auto because the vast majority of the time it will provide you the opportunities you need to activate your cards when you want to. But if you need more control for a specific situation, you can set the toggle to on. For example, if you want to use a quick effect during the draw phase, standby phase or end phase, or directly after a chain is finished resolving. But I did say all three options are valid, and I wasn't lying. If you are new to the game, I recommend mastering the auto and on toggle settings. But if you are looking to get better, learning to use the toggle off setting can be pretty good and it might even contribute to some wins. The toggle off setting means that whenever you would be given an opportunity to respond, you are instead not given that opportunity at all. But why would we choose to take opportunities away from ourselves? Well, by taking away our ability to respond, we also take away the delay that the opponent would feel when trying to figure out what cards we might have to use. If we have a trap card and we know exactly when we want to use it, if we are fast enough, then we could keep our toggle off until just before the right moment to use it, then we can turn it to auto or on so the opponent will not be able to tell from the delays what the back row was until it is too late. This is an incredibly risky move since if you get the timing wrong, you could actually end up hurting yourself instead of your opponent. Sometimes people put their toggle off planning to do this, but they are so used to the convenience of the auto toggle that they forget to turn their toggle back to on or auto because of the risky nature of it. I don't tend to play the toggle off minigame, but I do have my own uses for the toggle. If for whatever reason, 
reason, I know that the opponent cannot interrupt my plays. For example, if I am going first and the opponent doesn't have any hand traps I can stop, then I will turn my toggle off to do my plays. And the reason I do this is so that the opponent doesn't know whether or not I have any quick effects in my hand. Quick play spells are among the most commonly played back row in the game for their versatility. So I very commonly have them in my hand, but by having them in my hand with a toggle set to auto, my opponent will be able to feel a delay while I am comboing, and they will know that I have a quick effect in my hand, most likely a quick play spell. And that extra knowledge which could help them in the long run, in a variety of different ways. Giving your opponent as little information as possible is a big deal in this game, so just for the simple cost of pressing my toggle to off, my opponent won't know whether I have quick play spells in my hand, and then after setting my back row at the end of my plays, I can set my toggle to auto so that I am not at risk of the downsides of the off toggle. But why shouldn't I just set my back row before making my plays? That would also prevent the opponent from knowing whether my back row contains quick play spells. The reason I wouldn't do that, funnily enough, is the same reason I turn my toggle off when I know I can't be interrupted anyway. Information. If I set my back row from hand before making my plays, my opponent has now received a lot more information about my hand than I want them to have. They know that I have less usable cards in my hand, so I set some of the cards I can't use this turn. That means that if they have a way to interrupt my plays somehow, they can do so confidently, knowing that I won't have as many ways, if any ways, to follow up from it. This is of course in a different scenario than me just turning my toggle off, because I wouldn't turn my toggle off if my opponent has ways to interrupt me. The main thing is that if you have back row set, you should always do it after you have finished your plays. I'll give some examples of why. If the opponent has back row, and you have back row in hand, then you could set your back row and then begin to make your plays. One of your plays happens to include removing your opponent's back row, but it turns out one of the opponent's back row is actually back row removal, so they chain it and destroy your back row before your card removes that back row removal card. If you had simply waited until after your plays had finished, then your back row wouldn't have been removed. Another situation, your opponent doesn't have any back row, but they do have some monsters that can interrupt you. You set your back row, and then you go about your plays, and the opponent is given opportunities to interrupt your play. You don't have much, if any, cards in hand, so they know that if they interrupt you at a certain point, that you won't be able to continue playing. Let's run it back, but say you didn't set any back row, and your opponent is given the chance to interrupt you, but they see that you have more cards in your hand. They don't know anything about those cards, so they have have to second guess whether it's worth it to interrupt you, in case you have something else in hand to blow them out with. By doing this, you've replaced the certainty that your opponent will win the interaction with making your opponent question their actions, and that is much better than giving your opponent certainty for free. This is not something that you learn from a book or a dual column. This is just something that veterans of the game pick up from a lot of experience, and there are loads of other things I can give you right here, right now. While you're dueling, you can see at the top right hand corner of the screen, it shows what turn you're on, what phase you're on, and an hourglass symbol. This hourglass symbol will actually tell you a lot. When it isn't moving, it means that neither player is doing anything, or you are the one the game is asking to make a decision. When the color is dim and it isn't moving, what the opponent sees is the color being lit up and the symbol is rotating. And when your opponent is the one making a decision, then on their screen, they will see the dimly colored symbol staying still, and you will see the lit up symbol rotating. Looking at this symbol will help us to know when the opponent is being asked to activate something. If the the opponent has a back row set, and then we set a back row of our own, we should look at the hourglass to see if anything changes, even for just a moment. If it changes for just a moment, it means that they have something that can be activated that they can say no to. If nothing changes at all, it means that their card can't be activated. Using this and a bit of logic, we can determine what their set back row might be. First of all, we gotta recognize that the majority of the time, people play good back row more than they play bad back row. So if your opponent has any set back row, it is a pretty good bet that they are going to be using cards that many people play. You can see what spells and traps are most successful by going to the PvP arena, going into speed duels ranked, pressing the popularity ranking button next to the duel button, and looking at the spells section and traps section. In the case of spells, you're mainly going to be focusing on quick play spells though. This will let you see which traps and quick play spells are most popular, therefore the ones you are most likely to face against, but you should make sure you familiarize yourself with all of them. But more importantly, ask yourself 
what their face down could be at given times. If you haven't made any plays yet, you can see that their hourglass is moving already. You can tell that they have something that they can already activate. If that's the case, then check the field. What is on the field that could be making their hourglass budge? If they have a monster with a quick effect that doesn't rely on other cards being on the field, then they can mask whatever back row they might have with that, since any hourglass movement could instead be attributed to that monster. Same if they have a card like DD Crow or White Princess in hand, since they can activate them at pretty much any time. Other than those cases though, when their hourglass moves, think about the context. If the only time that their hourglass moves is when you summon a monster, but not when you use a spell or trap, and not when you use a monster's effect after it was summoned, then your opponent might have a trap that only activates when an opponent's monster is summoned, like Warning Point. If your opponent's hourglass doesn't move until there is another back row on the field, and then it keeps moving all the time, then it is most likely a back row removal like Cosmic Cyclone. If your opponent's hourglass moves anytime, anything happens at all, while there's a face-up monster on the field, there's a good chance that it's Book of Moon, Forbidden Chalice, or Compulsory Evacuation Device. If the opponent's hourglass doesn't move until there's a monster in your grave, it's probably Ice Dragon's Prison. If the opponent's hourglass doesn't move at all while they have monsters on their field, but suddenly it moves a lot while you have monsters on yours, it's probably Crackdown. If the opponent's hourglass doesn't move at all during your plays, you have to be really careful, because their back row might be something very powerful with a heavy activation condition, like Needle Ceiling, where they just have to wait until there are four monsters on the field like waiting for you to step on a mine. And then when you finally do, boom, your field is gone. Similar thing with something like Mirror Force. If nothing is activating after all of your plays are finished, there's a good chance your opponent's playing a battle trap. So you should have some way to play around that. If your toggle is off, then you won't be giving your opponent a lot of this information. However, even if your toggle is off, there will be a slight delay if one of your cards would otherwise ask you to activate it. So a very smart and experienced player may be able to tell you have something even if your toggle is off, but this skill is incredibly rare, even among competitive players. Did you know that it is actually possible to know what deck your opponent is playing before a single card has been activated by either player? The way we can tell is by looking at the character that the opponent is playing as. This is because every deck has a skill that it is best to use alongside that deck, and skills are always character specific. Looking at a character, you can look at the popularity rankings to see what skill is most popular for that character, and then you can look at DuelLinksMeta.com to see which decks are most popular with that skill. Many skills are deck specific, meaning that they can only really be used with one deck type. And other skills are generic, meaning that they can be played no matter what the deck type is. When a skill is deck specific, it's easy to tell what the deck the opponent is playing since there's really no choice. For example, Clear Wing Acceleration or Destiny Effect. You know right away that the opponent is playing Speedroids or Destiny Heroes. But for other skills like Three Effects or Switcheroo, the skill itself doesn't necessarily indicate what deck the opponent is playing. But that doesn't mean you're out of luck, because statistics can help you out. If you look up one of those generic skills on Duel Links meta, it'll show you what decks play it. For example, if you're facing against three effects, chances are that the opponent is playing Crusadia, Tenyi, Orcist, or Gokis. Knowing what deck your opponent might be playing before the duel begins can be important. At the very minimum level, you can mentally prepare for what you expect they are going to do, and think about how you are going to react to it. At a higher level though, perhaps your deck has a way to give you a better situation against the specific deck, so you can lean into that as your strategy rather than your normal strategy, rather than a strategy that would work well against another deck type. For example, a rank 4 deck has different options that they can go for depending on what they feel the opponent might be playing. If the opponent is playing Clear Wing Acceleration, they might summon a Steel Swarm Roach to put a dent in the opponent's Synchro Summon, but if the opponent is playing 3 effects, most decks that use 3 effects happen to use Grave Effects, so they could go for Abyss Dweller to prevent Grave Effect. There are skills though that will activate at the very start of the duel, so you'll be able to look in the duel log and see their skill and make the process of guessing their deck a lot easier. By knowing the opponent's deck, you'll be gaining a benefit, but at the same time, this logic can actually open up an opportunity for you. Some decks do not really need a specific skill, but they will have a skill that is generally accepted as the most advantageous skill for that deck. Because of this, whenever an opponent sees the character that uses that skill, they might be able to guess which deck you are playing and prepare for that. But what if you played a totally different skill to make them prepare for something that you aren't even going to do? The rank 4 example I gave earlier, let's say I'm playing Salamangrate and I want to use 3 effects as my skill for survivability or a burning roar for more extra deck space. I am going to gain benefits from these skills. However, 
if the opponent sees that I'm playing either of those skills, of course they will summon a Bist Roller because it's good against Cellar Mangrates and it's good against most of the other decks that use three effects. Maybe the benefits the skills give the deck are worth that risk. I'll leave that choice up to you. However, since the deck can function without the skill, I can use Ties That Bind on Yusei with Cellar Mangrate. Ties That Bind as a skill isn't as good as the other two skills for the deck, but the hidden benefit of it is that nobody is going to summon a Bist Dweller against Yusei. Everybody is going to summon Steel Swarm Roach against Yusei. And Roach doesn't even slightly impact my plays as a Cellar Mangrate player. So while my skill isn't giving me much bonus, my character is giving me a psychological advantage that leads to me not having to play through as many interruptions. Speaking of interruptions though, there are some mindsets that you gain through experience that can help you when playing against your opponent, or when your opponent is trying to play against you. Many new players, when they see that the opponent has multiple interruptions on the field, they feel overwhelmed and they feel like they have already lost the duel. There are a few things you can keep in mind to help you feel better about this situation. First things first. If the opponent has a board with a lot of interruptions, the chances are that they have used up a lot of resources to get all that. If your opponent has three back row, once that back row is all used up, most likely they've already used all that they've got, and they won't be able to match that power again in the long game since they used all the traps they opened so quickly to slow you down, they are going to be in a top deck situation. If your opponent has multiple monsters that can interrupt you, chances are that they used up a lot of their extra deck to do this. They probably won't be able to replicate this in the long game. Sometimes you are going to be able to play through all of the opponent's interruptions and steal the game away from them, but a lot of the time you are going to need to shift focus from winning to surviving. You don't have to dismantle everything the opponent has this turn, as a game is a lot more than just a single turn where players compare what they can accomplish on their first turns. But rather, if you can survive over the course of a few turns, you may be able to gradually build yourself up and cut your opponent down peg by peg until you can take their spot at the top of the hill. And in a late game situation, the more advantageous player is nearly guaranteed to win. While in the early turns, whoever has the most advantage doesn't necessarily have such a guarantee to win. The mindset of surviving and grinding through the opponent's onslaught isn't going to guarantee that you're going to win every game either because there's never a guarantee that you're going to win unless you are a hacker but it is going to drastically raise your win rate if you know what to do in these situations. Simply telling you not to give up isn't good enough. You gotta have a goal in mind to survive and build up your game plan gradually, keeping your own survival in the forefront of your mind. But your opponent may very well adopt this mindset when playing against you, when you set up your board. That's why it is important to know the best time to use your interruptions. You don't wanna interrupt your opponent's play just for them to do something else that made it almost as if you hadn't interrupted them in the first place. You might've been in this exact same situation before. The most important lesson you can learn is when to say no to your own interruption. Much of the time, this is going to require you to look at all of the context on the field to make the best decision that fits the situation. It's going to be different from time to time. An easy thing to ask yourself in these situations to help you make the right decision is whether something will hurt you if you don't interrupt it, and if something is going to hurt you, is it going to hurt you in a way that you can still stop something that you are more afraid of? Let's say you have a Crystal Link Synchro Dragon on the field. It can negate any monster effect. The opponent has a Blackwing Gale the Whirlwind, and they use it to reduce your Crystal Wings attack to 1500. And you know that this would make a difference in a way you wouldn't like. You'd prefer that your Crystal Wing wasn't reduced. That said, you know that after they use Gale, they're going to summon Raikiri, which can destroy you. Being reduced, you at least get to stay on the field. But being destroyed, it doesn't matter what your stats are, because you aren't going to be on the field anymore. So you'd much rather let them use their Gale, so you can later negate their Raikiri, because that would hurt you much more. Of course, this is only something that you would know if you knew about Raikiri. Just seeing Gale on the field, if you've never seen Blackwings before, how are you going to know about Raikiri? The only way is that you either lose against it one time on ranked, so that you can do better next time, or you can learn things before you face them. There's some things that you just can't learn by fighting against a deck a certain amount of times on ranked. You can figure out a lot. In fact, you can learn enough to do well in a tournament while playing against those decks. You can learn more by actually looking at their decks after the duel, or by looking at other people's versions of that deck on Duel Links meta. Doing this and reading through all of their cards and looking at it and figuring out how their deck works, you can get a lot of understanding about the opponent's mindset the next time you play against that deck type, on top of everything you learn through playing against it. Knowing what your opponent wants to do, you can also figure out at which points during their plays they least want to get interrupted at, and you can take advantage of their weakest points once you've learned what 
what they are. Even learning how to play their deck can give you that knowledge. And on this channel, we generally try to make guides for how to play all of the best decks in the game so that anybody who wants to join the competitive scene can learn about the decks they want to play or the decks they expect to play against and be better equipped for top tier duels. We are only two guys though, and it takes time for us to make videos in the quality that we want to make them in. So doing your own research is important too, and I'm sure you're probably tired of being told to do research. Pretty much everyone says it, but it isn't exactly the easiest thing to do, especially for a new player that doesn't know what the research entails or how much learning is necessary. I'm going to give you all my tips for how to stay up to date with any given metagame in Duel Links. First, you gotta acknowledge that in order for the game to remain interesting, decks have to be different from each other. And when decks are different, of course, context surrounding each deck and their relationships with each other are going to cause some decks to be more successful than others. This isn't to say that just because you play a certain deck you are guaranteed to win against decks that are less successful, or that you are guaranteed to lose against decks that are more successful. Many players have the negative mindset that a less successful deck is always going to lose to a more successful deck. In this game, often the player is more important than the card, but of course the cards are still important. The cards are important enough that you have to be aware of them in order to prepare to face against them. The preparation is what separates a competitive player from a casual player. A casual player can play a top tier deck and a competitive player can play an untiered deck, but there's a good chance that the competitive player is going to win anyway because they are better prepared to fight against those top decks. Because of how many different strategies are in the game, the fact of the matter is that you simply can't prepare for everything. The great thing is though, you aren't going to fight against everything. The vast majority of the time, you are only going to go against roughly the best 20 decks in the game. And of all those matchups, the majority of your games will be against maybe the top 5 or top 10 of those top 20. We call the decks that you are likely to face against the expected matchups. The expected matchups are the only decks you ever really need to concern yourself with when you're researching, unless you just really enjoy learning about all the decks in the game like me. The expected matchups since they are the matchups you will be facing the majority of the time, are the only matchups that you need to prepare yourself for. The cards you decide to play in order to prepare yourself for the expected matchups shouldn't be good against just one of them. They should instead be versatile and strong against the majority, if not all, of the expected matchups. If you look at Chain Disappearance, this card can cripple some decks in a way that is impossible to recover from. The problem is that even though this card is strong when it's good, it isn't good against all or even a majority of the expected matchups. Hypothetically, if a format came around where 85% or more of the expected matchups would lose if they faced this card, then this might be a good card to play in that format. Since this isn't the case right now, it isn't worth playing. As this video is coming out, a card like this that most of the time isn't good against most decks, Artifact Lancia, is worth playing right now. It prevents both players from banishing anything the turn it is used, which can be amazing for crippling decks that rely on banishing in order to get their plays going. And as it happens, the best decks in the game, and the majority of the other expected matchups, will rely on banishing in some way or another, so Lancia is worth playing. But there are many other formats where not enough of the expected matchups rely on banishing, meaning that this would be a dead card in your hand if you drew it in those matchups. We don't want to play cards that would be dead in our hand. We want to play cards that are always good. Thankfully, the most generically strong cards are always good, so you can always rely on these generic cards if you are unsure what cards you can use to prepare for the expected matchups. Of course, there will be contexts in certain formats where one or more of these will be less favorable, and that's something you'll only be able to figure out by analyzing the best decks in the game. Every deck has to do something that sets it apart to give it an edge against other decks. Sometimes that edge can warp the rest of the game around it. For example, in 2019, Six Samurai having the spell trap negate of Xi'an made it so that if you wanted to be successful, you either had to play an overabundance of back row in order to bait out the Xi'an negate, or you had to not rely on back row at all so that you weren't vulnerable to the negate. That is one of the more extreme examples, but an example of a deck that has warped a format around itself more recently is Orcus, which has a boss monster that can prevent destruction by detaching material from itself. Orcist being as good as it is, finds itself as one of the expected matchups. Orcist's presence in the meta has players deciding not to play Mystical Space Typhoon, as the fact that it destroys cuts down its versatility against one of the main expected matchups. And it isn't much of a sacrifice, considering that Cosmic Cyclone fulfills the same purpose against every other deck, while not being useless against Orcist. These are just examples of how the presence of a deck within the expected matchups can play a part in how you prepare your deck. 
Two different versions of the same deck can be equally valid despite being very different. The only difference is being what matchups those versions of the deck were preparing themselves for. In the individual matchups you will find yourself in, you might have a general idea of how to interact with the opponent's deck. Stop something that would hurt you more than other things would, hurt them where it hurts most rather than where it hurts a little bit, but at the end of the day, having a general understanding of gameplay logic can only take you so far in this game. You also have to learn matchups individually. You can think about how your deck and the deck you want to get better at beating, consider your game plan against them. Consider their game plan against you. Try to think ahead of time of how you are going to react to their reactions. I know it sounds silly, but this really is a game where you can learn to think three turns ahead. And it takes a lot of practice and research, but I've given you the tools for research, and the rest is something you have to get with experience. I've seen plenty of people take the advice I've given in this video and eventually become good enough to win tournaments. And in the Team 6K Discord, there are some members who have improved so drastically that I wouldn't be surprised at all if they won a 6K tournament sometime soon. They are very likely getting very valuable experience from the tournament experience. And if you feel like you are ready to learn from the competitive environment that a tournament can provide, be sure to check out the Team 6K Discord, link in description, where we host a tournament every Saturday. And every week it's an awesome thing to see everybody thinking of new ways to up their game and come out on top. Even those that don't win, we can see the cogs in their brain turning, and the next week, bringing what they've learned and doing something even cooler. We'd love to have you joining in. It really is a great way to become a better duelist. More than just research and experience though, a great way to maintain a healthy understanding of the game is to have a group of people to talk to about it, whether it be your friends or your fellow competitors, as long as it's a group that can challenge each other on their ideas rather than agreeing with each other all the time. Because if everyone agrees, then nobody's opinions are strengthened through conversation. But when there are disagreements and a healthy discussion is had, then one side may have their mind changed, and perhaps the one whose mind wasn't changed might understand their own viewpoint better than before. We have a lot of that in the Discord as well, a lot of different perspectives that lead to some pretty good discussions that lead to a better understanding of decks, deck building concepts, or the format overall. If you have a group of friends like that, then that's fantastic, but if you are in need of some people to talk about the game with, then the Discord has a lot of that as well. Not just our Discord, but a bunch of other Discord communities that others have built up, and many of them have tournaments as well. The very last thing I want to say about becoming better as a duelist is that there's a very important trait you need to have to truly find success as a duelist in any of Yu-Gi-Oh's formats. A healthy attitude towards the game is vital. You need to be willing to adapt to change. You need to be willing to find new ways of problem solving. And while it is good to have criticisms about a particular format, complaining as if there's nothing that can be done about it isn't exactly a path to success. Don't give up when things get hard, just find another way. It can be hard of course, but when you have like-minded people People to help you with it, then none of you will be alone when doing so. I hope that this video has been helpful to you. If you have any questions or any advice of your own, be sure to leave them in the comments and we can talk about it. And if you like the video, then slap like now, subscribe if you haven't already, hit that bell to get notified every time we make a new video. And I've been Undead from Team 6K, signing out. Hey, why they gotta hate on me? I done got me a quarter million views and they still saying they low key. They ain't wanna come work with the kid, but I'm flexing with Zay on beats. How they ask for a spot at the gym, but they leave all the weight on me. I don't ask them to wait on me. They would ask where they gonna be. With a song if they wanted the weatherman, I ain't asking to pay no fees. She was homeless and needed a spot. I ain't asking to pay no lease. I ain't asking to say no please. I ain't asking to make no cheese. Scream fake, but it ain't on me. Got clean so it ain't no streets. Why green if it ain't no keeps? Brought cream so it ain't no beef. My team say it ain't no chief. My demon, they hang on me. They seemingly ain't no peace. I seen him, he ain't no beast. For